I want to thank everybody for coming today and uh, thank uh, Dean Hildreth for helping to organize um, this event um, today. Welcome to the store uh, lecturer um, here at UC Davis. I want to thank um, Dr. Moran for flying across the country to attend um, and give the lecture today. <laughs> um, it's 410, and so we like to stick to 410 for everybody. Um, Dr. Moran began her academic journey at the University of Texas in Austin, studying mate choice in pigeons as an undergraduate. She went on to obtain her PhD in um, zoology at the University of Michigan, um, Ann Arbor, where she began working on the evolutionary ecology of aphids with uh, W.D. Hamilton as one of her advisors. She immediately began to build an outstanding body of research using an integrative approach drawing on molecular biology, genomics, experimental and theoretical bi biology, providing insights into genomics um, and the molecular uh, mechanisms that underpin symbiosis. Her work provides evidence how the this interdependence affects host evolution and diversi diversification by sequencing whole genomes and determining biological functions in various bacterial symbionts and of bacterial symbionts on ecology and adaptation of their hosts. From 1986 and 210, she served on the faculty of the University of Arizona, where she was a regent's professor. She joined the Yale faculty in 2010 as the, Fleming H., the William H. Fleming Professor in Bi Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, where she is working on the metagenome of gut microbiota of honeybees and has found a high degree of genetic diversity within bacterial species colonizing bee gut. She will be moving to the University of Texas at Austin in the near future. Deservedly, in 1997, Dr. Moran was awarded the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship. She was elected to membership in the National Academy of Sciences in 2004 and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2004. She was also elected to the American Academy of Microbiology in 2004 and to the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2007. In 2010, she was awarded the International Prize for Biology by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science for her work on the relationship, relationships between insects and their endosymbiotic bacteria. Dr. Moran's research has shown symbiosis to be an important source of evolutionary diversity and novelty and has provided concrete evidence of its contributions to ecological niche expansion, defense, and essential molecules, and has established principles common to the diverse spectrum of symbiotic relationships. These achievements has, have contributed enormously to the understanding of evolution and the complexity of biological diversity. And she has had close co collaborations with col colleagues here at UC Dav Davis. Um, I want to welcome her to UC Davis for the lecture. and. Um, Thank her for um, giving her, us this lecture today. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Leslie, and um, thank you all for inviting me here. It's really a, an honor to talk to this incredible group of biologists here at UC Davis and a lot of people I've known for a long time and a lot of people I'm just meeting um, today. It's been really fun. So I am going to talk to you. I have to pick some subset of things to talk to you about. And I'm going to talk about insect endosymbionts, um, the kind of insect endosymbionts that actually approach being like cell organelles. And some people would argue that you could just call them that. Um, they're very, very closely associated with the insects, and they're maternally transmitted. So I'm going to focus on those, even though, as Leslie mentioned, I'm actually doing a lot of work now on, on sort of real bacteria that you can grow in the lab that um, live in the guts of honeybees. So you'll have to ask me about that if you want to hear about it. Um, and first of all, just it's kind of an amazing thing in biology now. Um, if, you, if you're older and you remember that in, not too long ago, we didn't really, if you're studying insects or other animals or plants, you really didn't think about microorganisms very much um, as, a, as major parts of their lives. Mainly you thought about diseases that they may or may not get, and that was pretty much it. Now it seems like everyone is studying the microbiota of pretty much everything and assuming that, that microorganisms are controlling everything. It's almost like gone too far because animals do have their own genes and they're important too. <laughs> um, but 
but it's an amazing transformation, this recognition. A lot of that is because of technology. We can now study the microbial world, the uncultured microbial world, understand what, what really is there and what, try to understand what it's doing using genomics and informatics. So it, it's added a lot um, to this kind of this universe of what, what is visible to us. But just for example, if you take an herbivorous insect, there's all kinds of microbes living in different positions with respect to the insect that may be associated with it for a long time or short times. So intracellular um, symbionts that live inside cells, those are the ones I'm going to focus on today. But I just wanted to start off by reminding you, so these are living inside the cytosol of specialized insect cells. They're not in the gut. This picture should tell you they're not in the gut. They're in special cells. Um, but of course, there can be gut microbes as well or microbes on the, in the food or on the surface. It might also be interacting um, with the insect ecology or the host ecology in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and people are interested in a lot of those nowadays, and it's really fantastic to see all the new work that's being done. And depending on where the microbes are, they have different possibilities of doing things um, for, for the insect. For example, it's hard for an intracellular symbiont to be involved in detoxifying stuff that comes in in the food because by the time it gets inside those cells, the, the insect's already intoxicated. Um, but it, it's, um, I, I've actually worked on working a lot more on the gut symbionts in bees, but today I'm just going to focus on the intracellular symbionts. And here's kind of the storyline I'm going to give you, and then you can sort of see if it makes sense in the end. It's kind of summarizing a lot of different work and examples, so it's going to be short on details in some parts. You'll just have to ask me later or email me. So first of all, symbiont acquisitions, I think it's really clear, and one of the clear um, results from a lot of these studies is that the acquisition of endosymbionts, um, especially these vertically transmitted ones, are the base, are a required part of many large radiations of um, organisms, particularly in insects, basically all the sap feeding insects, all of that feed on phloem or xylem sap, which are thousands and thousands of species that are ecologically very important, all of them require these kinds of symbionts as new, new, for nutritional supplementation. So if you took those out of terrestrial ecosystems, we'd have a very different world. And there's other cases like that, termites, cockroaches, um, blood, some blood feeding insects, and so on. So there's a lot of groups out there that wouldn't exist without these symbiont acquisitions. They've been important evolutionary events. But when this happens, um, and when these symbionts are vertically transmitted, um, usually down matrilines, lines, so from mother through eggs, when this happens, you get this syndrome, um, which I'll just refer to as the resident genome syndrome, um, which results from a very different population structure. So suddenly this bacterium, instead of living in a number of different places and having um, different strains, maybe colonize the same insect and lots and recombination between strains, suddenly you have one single clone that's being transmitted vertically um, down a matriline of insects and no longer interacting genetically with any other strain. So as you have this clonal population structure and probably a much smaller population size because they're restricted to this animal host instead of living. So, so you get this kind of dramatic change in the genomes and it's really um, a pervasive phenomenon. It happens in many different bacterial lineages that go down this lifestyle um, route. But then the hosts, of course, they're dependent. They, they evolve complete dependence on these symbionts. Their whole way of life depends on them. And they're um, dependent on these things that are basically kind of degenerate because of this syndrome, which I'll tell you more about. And so that raises the question, what happens? Do the hosts just go extinct? Maybe some of them do. I guess those are, those are the hard things to study. Um, but w sometimes there's other, um, other com compensatory evolution that can happen. So just to give an idea, so how many organisms have um, these different kinds of symbionts. So these ancient, strictly maternal symbionts, um, I'll talk about aphids and some other sap-feeding insects. Cockroaches have them. It's turning out that a lot of weevils have them, tsetse flies, um, so on. So a number of different insect groups can have these kinds of symbionts, but still not all insects have them. And, um, and these are ones that are obligate. Usually the insect has a special organ that houses these symbionts. So it happens in a number of insect groups. It's actually turning out that it's a larger percentage than we thought because a lot of these insects don't actually have a large organ that was noticed early on by some of the early workers using microscopy, but they still do have this kind of symbiont, a particular bunch of beetles. And then, since beetles are most animals, or mo most insects and actually most animals described, um, depending on how many beetles have those kinds of organs, have these kinds of symbioses, that number would increase, right? And we don't know fully, but... And then there's some that are vertically transmitted. So another category would be that ones that are vertically transmitted down mat matrilines through the egg, but there's some horizontal transfer. And sometimes you get co-infections in individual hosts. 
And so this is very different because in this case, the co-infections can have recombination. The genomes may exchange elements or um, genes or phage or whatever. So you have these very different kind of um, syndrome with the, um, with the genomes. These would include the most famous would be Wolbachia, but there's a number of others that also show these patterns, Arsenophonus, Hamiltonella, and Regiella are in aphids. And these are really common. Probably most insects either have them or have had them in their past. Maybe all insects have had them in their past. It's actually turning out that a lot of insect genomes um, have genes in them that were picked up from these kinds of symbionts, Wolbachia, Arsenophonus, but they now become insect genes. So this tells you that in the past the insect had these, these groups. So these are really important probably in the long run in insect evolution. I'm not going to talk so much about them. And then gut symbionts, almost everything has gut symbionts. Some sap feeding insects have almost none. So there's some exceptions that don't really have much of a gut microbiota, but almost all animals do have a gut microbiota. So those, those have very, um, lots of horizontal transfer between individuals. Um, they're very dynamic, lots of genome variation. So, um, so there's these different possibilities. But today I'll just be talking about the first one. Just to give a little bit of history, um, um, this, this is um, Paul Buchner, um, who did a lot of early work in, wor in Germany, worked with a bunch of students and so on, and um, um, summarized a, all of the book. There was an English translation of his main book in 1965, which is sort of the Bible of um, the field. If people go there, if they need a new project, they just find something that hasn't been worked on um, since he looked at it. And there's, um, and, in, and um, he documented these heritable symbioses. He hypothesized that many of them were involved um, in nutrition for the insect host, so that they had a nutritional role, that they tended to occur in insects that fit on limited diets, and that um, he basically used microscopy to document this. So he was very limited in terms of his ability. He didn't have any molecular um, data, of course. And then um, actually in the room today is Paul Bauman and Linda Bauman, who who start, really started um, the study of these symbionts um, using molecular data. And that was with um, aphids and Buchnera, the first system, and named Buchnera. Um, started to realize that you could use sequences to actually explore this world, which has now just turned into a, a giant field um, with lots of people in it. So one of the models is this, the P. aphid model um, for these symbioses. Um, so this is P. aphids um, on a plant. and. They have the obligate symbiont Buchnera aphidicola, and then they can have several facultative symbionts, Hamiltonella defensa, serratia, symbiotica species of serratia that's symbiotic in aphids, and these are maternally transmitted. They're all, and Buchnera is only maternally transmitted, whereas these have occasional horizontal transmission based on just using molecular phylogenetics. We can see that they've moved around um, using markers, even though we don't necessarily know how, how they move around. Um, so they're maternally transmitted. If you keep them in the lab, they're just maternally transmitted. And the genomes for all of these are sequenced, and also for the P. aphid um, genome sequence was published a couple years ago. So what are they doing in there? So it turns out Buchner was largely right about his nutritional hypothesis. Um, these symbionts in general have been found to play nutritional roles in their host. They donate, they make nutrients um, using pathways that animals generally don't have. For example, the 10 or so essential amino acids um, if you look at phloem sap, which is the sole diet of aphids, it's lacking in, it has very low amounts of essential amino acids, lower than are optimal for um, balanced nutrition in insects, and so Buchnera can make the essential amino acids. That was the hypothesis. One thing to note, though, is before the Buchnera genome, before Buchnera was really studied um, in terms of genomics, um, people basically hypothesized a lot of things that the symbionts might do, that they make sterols, that they do this, they do that, a lot of things that they don't, in fact, do. So, I mean, now we can know, you know not only what they do, but also we can rule out a few things that basically we just don't mention anymore. Um, because so this is just um, harking back to the early work, um, the, the basic pattern, and this is seen again and again in um, different um, ones of these symbioses, I'll give you a list, is that these symbionts, um, are ancient in the host, so Buchnera is very ancient. It, it um, infected an ancestor of all living aphids, which is at least 100 million years ago, so there's some fossils for aphids and so on, so maybe closer to 200 million years, um, depending on how you interpret the fossils, so very ancient. And this vertical transmission seems to have been absolutely faithful ever since, because you can look at phylogenies at different levels for the Buchnera and the aphids, and they match. And so that each time the aphids speciate, the Buchnera the Buchnera also diverge, and you get this matching pattern, whether you do it within a species at a deeper level or for all aphids. So this is just an illustration from one of the old, lots of trees were made. This is just a 
illustration. So they're living inside bacteriocytes, inside these specialized cells. So here's an opened aphid, and these kind of grayish cells are the bacteriocytes. Um, each bacteriocyte can hold something like 10,000 aphids, and um, each, I mean, in 10,000 bacteria, and um, there may be 50 to 100 bacteriocytes, depending on the aphid species, so a limited number of these cells in an aphid. Um, and then each one of them is surrounded by a host-derived um, host membrane around each bacterial cell. So Paul Bellman originally actually sequenced a lot of, cloned and sequenced a lot of genes having to do with amino acid biosynthesis in um, Buchnera. And then in 2000, the genome was sequenced um, by a, a group in Japan. Um, and all of that work basically verified that, in fact, Buchnera has a gene set that's, that's highly um, modified in a way that would support amino acid biosynthesis for the aphid, even though overall the genome is quite small. So it, these are the, this is from this genome paper, um, just shows that basically the um, essential amino acid pathways are largely intact. Those are the yellow ones here. Those, the yellow steps are the ones that have a gene in the Buchnera genome, whereas the non-essential amino acid pathways, so these will be the ones that are redundant with the with the insect host that has these capabilities. These are largely lost, with a couple of exceptions. And um, there's a couple of missing things over here. So this last gene in um, branch chain amino acid was missing. Um, this hypothesized maybe the aphid um, provided that step of the pathway. And it turns out it looks like that's true. Um, I'll show you some data from the aphid end later. So there's a little bit of. Um, things that are hard to explain, but mostly it's a very crisp pattern. So one big limitation with all of these systems is we, we, we can't grow them in the lab. That's in, in some ways why I started working on these gut symbionts of bees. There's more experimental capabilities there, but, but, um, but still sometimes we, we, we keep a lot of lines of aphids and, and symbionts in the lab. And over time, basically, these, we realized over time that these lab lines are basically mutation accumulation experiments because we grow them under the most wonderful conditions that an aphid could ask for. The, the seedling fava bean plants, constant 20 degrees, no stress of any kind. So different mutations happen, and using, I mean, as sequencing gets cheaper and you sort of sequence, we, we've run into some of these mutations and been able to establish that they happen in the lab. And, um, for example, um, and when they happen, uh, we can like at least show that here's here's a mutation that affected something about the biology. So, um, uh, for example, mutation in one a frame shift mutation in one of the steps in arginine biosynthesis creates a requirement. Like you can grow a P aphids on artificial diet, and you can show that that creates a requirement for arginine in the diet. You know, so the and there's other experimental evidence that yes, the Buchnera really are making these compounds for the aphid host. Um, so since that time, in the last um, something like 10 years ago, started on uh, the symbionts in the Okinarinka, which are another group of sap-feeding insects. And they were one that, that Paul Buchner, um, he referred to it as the El Dorado, or the fairyland of um, symbiosis, because there's all these complex symbioses, several symbionts in the same host. It's very complex. And um, he tried to work out an evolutionary scheme for how the symbionts were acquired and so forth. And um, the, the initial system we looked at was, um, was these things called sharpshooters, and then later looked at some others, including spittle bugs. And what happens is, in these things, um, they have a specialized bacterium. They're actually brightly colored like this, um, without any dyes. Um, and they, these bacteriums house two different symbionts. And it, one of them is called Solcia mulleri, after a, a, a Moravian um, embryologist who studied leafhoppers. And then Balmania, after Paul, ba Paul and Linda Bauman, that, um, is a gamma proteobacterium. So for example, sharpshooters such as the glassy wing sharpshooter that probably you know about it in Davis, California, um, a pest of grapes because it transmits disease of grapes. It has both of these symbionts, and every sharpshooter has both of them. And they're from completely different bacterial groups. Um, and then in other um, Okinawinka, they'll tend to almost always have solcia, but they'll have a different partner um, symbiont. So in this case, it's Balmania. Over here, it's Zinderia. And there's some others, one Hodgkinia and cicadas. So the picture is sort of like this. We did a bunch of phylogenetics, and here's the picture that gave rise to this fairyland of symbiosis. It said, OK, the whole Okinawink is probably a clade of insects, a related group of insects. It's actually the, the very oldest herbivorous insects um, known from the fossil record are Okinawinka. Um, and it includes cicadas, spittle bugs, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, plant hoppers. All the entomologists in here are the only ones who know all those. But 
but it is a very large number, of, you know, many tens of thousands of species of insect, and some of them important as disease vectors. And then, so it looks like Solcia was actually acquired in a common ancestor of all the Okinawinka. So that's in the Permian, something like 270 million years ago. Um, it was acquired. It was retained by most of them. Sometimes it was lost here and there. And then different groups acquired another symbiont that is the companion of Solcia. Um, in the case of sharpshooters, it's Valmania. In the case of spittlebugs, it's Cinderia. And so they have this kind of mosaic of different ones in these different groups. So together with John McCutcheon, who was a postdoc in the lab, he's now at University of Montana, um, I started, the next gen sequencing came out. And actually, he, he sequenced the very first full genome sequence from a bacterium using next gen, at least the first one published, which was um, the sequence of um, Solcia, um, because previously um, we'd sequenced the genome of Balmania in collaboration with Jonathan Eisen, um, who was then at Tiger. But we only got the Balmania, we didn't get the Solcia, at least not all of it. So John came along and with the advantage of, um, of I think it was 454 sequencing, um, it was pretty easy. And so we could start to put together what are these different bacteria doing in these complex symbioses and why does it get complex? Why not just stick with one bacteria? I mean, why get, sometimes there's even more than two. We've stuck with the ones with two. So basically the, you sequence the genome, you figure out all the pathways that are in there that are intact and then figure out what should be the predicted capabilities of these bacteria and then try to put it together and puzzle out who's doing what. So this is just a picture of one of those for Solcia, which has a tiny genome, so it's easy to put a lot of it on one of these pictures. Um, and the red things here are essential amino acids that it has the full pathway for. And so it makes seven, um, it makes eight essential amino acids, eight of the ten that need, it, that need to be provided for these hosts. And so um, it turns out that Solcia makes these eight and Balmania, which previously makes exactly the other two, so there's this kind of perfect complementarity between it. Um, so histidine and methionine are made by Balmania. These other eight are all made by Solcia. And so you get your full set of 10, just like Buchnera provides for its aphid hosts. And then cicadas, um, so next John, got the cicadas. And uh, um, they again have Solcia. So, um, and again, it makes exactly the same eight. Um, and they have this partner, which is from the alpha proteobacterium Hodgkinia, named after Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, who studied cobalamin. And Hodgkinia makes histidine and methionine. So again, it's this perfect pattern of complementarity that just converges on this. It's kind of, it tells you that, that those sequences do mean something, right? It's not just kind of a, a jumbled mess. Um, and interestingly, though, this poor Hodgkinia, um, it makes methionine using a different methionine synthase, and it's the cobalamin-dependent one. So cobalamin is this vitamin B12. So a cobalamin-like molecule is a cofactor for this enzyme. And it, uh, even though the enzyme is just one gene, the methionine synthase, cobalamin requires a whole bunch of genes to make it. So it is carrying around this burden of making cobalamin just for this one, apparently for this one enzyme. So, um, it's about 10% of, uh, it's a huge proportion of its actual genome, this cobalamin pathway. And then we did spittlebugs. Um, and so we had a spittlebug that was growing in Tucson, grabbed some of them and started studying them. And, um, so again, Solcia makes seven amino acids. It has lost the full tryptophan pathway. Tryptophan's a long pathway. It's lost all the genes. And in this case, the partner is yet another. It's a beta proteobacterium, and it makes histidine, methionine, and tryptophan, which is seven genes. So it's got this kind of perfect pattern, and it makes you feel like the, the genome sequences actually do mean something, So, um, which is a good thing to be reassured about now and then. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Jonathan's laughing, but... Um, so um, by now, a whole bunch of genome sequences for symbionts have, have been completed. This is most of them, not all, but for, di for different insect groups. And basically, all of them have this sort of nu apparent nutritional role, making either cofactors, vitamins, or amino acids. Sometimes they're um, recycling um, um, ammonia, for example, in the bladibacterium in cockroaches. And so the a whole bunch of them. And they have several features in common. So this is starting with 2000, the first Buchnera one going up to the present, this one that's not published yet. but. Um, basically, they're, um, they're very small. They have these nutritional genes, despite the fact that they're extremely tiny genomes. In fact, they, they include the tiniest known bacterial genomes. In fact, I think all five of the tiniest known bacterial genomes are in this set of insect symbionts. And they come from different bacterial groups. And they tend, most of them are very AT biased in nucleotide base composition. So this is like a convergent pattern that's evolved repeatedly in different groups of bacteria that have gone in for this way of life. So this is just 
giving a little um, update on bacterial genomes in general. If you look at the size of a bacterial genome, so in megabases going, you know, from it goes up a little higher, but this is just looking at some set going up to eight megabases. And the number of genes is a very close correlation in general, right? So bacterial genomes are made of genes. They don't have all that stuff in between. In general, they're very high coding density, so size is a very good predictor of the number of genes. And up until 2006, it seemed like 500 genes or something like that or a little less was pretty much the minimum. Several groups were known to be that small, so mycoplasma, bugnera, um, several seemed to go about to that size. But it seemed like there was kind of a limit. You couldn't go smaller. And several, lots of papers written on the minimal genome and all this. But then we, we started finding um, these smaller ones. The first one was the symbiont of psyllids, carcinella, um, and one was 160 kilobases. But then it turned out there was a whole bunch that are really, really tiny. Um, Hodgkinia is 145, Tremblea, and then um, I don't think it's on here. The, the Nasuia is only um, 120 kilobases. This is the first one, carcinella, which it was um, a tiny genome on the 160 kilobases, about 180 genes. Um, here's a psyllid nymph. Here's the organ where it lives, um, where these bacteriocytes are. Here's one bacteriocyte. So this, these tiny genome bacteria um, have very large cells, often very kind of amorphous cells. So these are these sort of strap-like things that can be very long. They can be up to 40 microns long. Um, so many, they have to have many chromosomes within, within those cells, but the genome size is really tiny. So they often have lost basically the architecture of a normal bacterial cell. And here's an EM of them. This is just a kind of little diagram of, on the outside is mycobacterium, mycoplasma, sorry if I said mycobacterium, mycoplasma genitalium. That's the, small, the smallest genome, the one Craig Venter works on as a minimal genome, whatever. Um, it, it can be grown in culture. Um, and it's 580 kilobases, a little bit small, about the size of Bucnera. All these other ones are quite a bit smaller, and these are just drawn to scale to give you an impression of it. So this so-called resident genome ph phenomenon, you have this, this certain lifestyle. It can be pathogenic, but especially these, um, these mutualistic symbionts that are vertically transmitted. Repeatedly, if you just look across the tree of life, you get this whole cascade of the same things happening again and again in these tiny genomes that, um, that you get massive reduction in the genome size, loss of all these genes, because you can't get smaller without losing genes, and, and also rapid sequence, very rapid sequence evolution in all the genes of the genome. And it's all over the tree of life, and most of the cases are in bacteria, but even archaea and eukaryotes, they're basically parallel cases of these kind of things. The most extreme cases are the ones I'm talking to you about, these insect nutritional symbionts. And it's also ir it's irreversible, like basically you don't go back once you go down this pathway. Um, you just all you can do is get smaller, it seems. So what causes it? So this is just a little, the only um, summary of kind of the population genetics just to give what I want you to do is have an intuition for what causes this. So one thing that happens, of course, is once you're living inside an insect cell and that's specialized, well, you just, a lot of genes, are, there's relaxed selection. You don't need those genes anymore, right? They're not useful anymore. You don't live in the same, don't have the same ecology. You don't need to break down some substrate or do different things. So there's relaxed selection on many genes. You probably have a more controlled environment. Um, and so those might be lost. Mutations accumulate in their loss. But, the, but many genes, it's hard to explain them, their disappearance in this way. They seem universally useful. Um, DNA repair genes, a lot of just genes involved in basic cell processes, they're also lost. So it seems like everyone would benefit from having these genes, and yet they're lost. And so the other part of the equation is that this um, greater level of genetic drift that results from having a small population size and being strictly clonal because you're only transmitted maternally, so you basically get more drift, more deleterious mutations being fixed, which those mutations might basically knock out a gene that's not essential. They might inactivate it through a frame shift, or they might just make, the, make an amino acid change that makes it a little less efficient. Either way, they're basically deleterious, but of course not lethal. If they were lethal, we wouldn't see them. Um, and then if weakly selected genes, genes that are useful but not essential, are eliminated, then the DNA gets eliminated. And Probably that's just through mutational pressure. I mean, basically, there's more deletions than insertions. At least that's the simplest way to explain that. And then many of the genes that are lost, or, or many, many DNA repair genes are lost as part of this process. If you look at gene sets, they lose many DNA repair genes in these small genomes. So that could actually elevate the, the actual mutation rate. You're getting more mutations coming in because 
most repair pathways have the effect of lowering the mutation rate. So you get kind of this cascade of things happening, which results in um, losing genes and also in fast evolution of the genes that remain. And so the, some of the signatures are you get rapid protein evolution, which basically lots of amino acid replacements compared to the DNA evolution. Um, the proteins have low thermal stability. Um, you get very high expression of chaperones, chaperones, which I'll mention again, could be kind of a counter, a comp compensatory adaptation to this low stability. And then you, you don't get other, other signatures of weak selection or like use of special codon. Some codons are better than others. You don't get sort of that refined um, selection on codon use and things like that. It's basically random. So the, the pattern you get, here's just a picture of a bacterial tree of, you know, basically close to the tree of life bacterial tree showing um, these different symbiont groups on it. And these branches are proportion, or this is based on proteins on universal or widely distributed proteins, um, amino acid sequences, and the branches are proportional to um, the amount of evolution in these different lineages. So um, here's Solsia. So you basically see again and again that these, so here's the Bacteroidetes, the very rapid re evolution of Solsia. Here you have the Mycoplasmas. They also have fast evolution. Um, down here you've got um, Hodgkinia, which is the one in, um, cicadas with a tiny genome, very incredibly long branches. Um, here's Zenderia, Carcinella, and so on. So Bugnera is on somewhat fast, but, but not, like, not crazy fast like those. So basically, again and again, you get this incredible pattern of very fast evolution. The proteins are still full length. They still reading frame. The, the active sites will still tend to be conserved, but much of the protein will be full of amino acids um, that have changed, that, that allow a higher AT composition in the genome, for example. So most of these are very AT biased. It's another almost universal pattern, but there's a couple of exceptions, one being Hodgkinia. Um, but most of them are very AT biased. So the, um, if you look at the GC content, it's very low in these tiny genomes. Um, and then it gets kind of just a cloud as you get into sort of more normal sized genomes. And then and the AT bias has this big impact on, on the proteins. I think this, this there's no way this couldn't be deleterious if you ask me. You have a mutational bias towards A and T that causes all of your proteins to change and to use amino acids that, that allow more A's and T's in the codons. So for example, um, isoleucine, um, which is, starts with A, T, so you can have, um, basically you have a very high number of those in the AT biased organisms like Zenderia and Carcinella. Whereas alanine, you'll have a very low number because you have to have a G and a C. And so basically just most mutations are, the interpretation is that most mutations are going towards A and T. This has a big impact on the protein sequences themselves. Well, if you look at the gene sets in these tiny genomes, so the ones sequenced with John McCutcheon and a couple later, but um, the, um, the, they're small genomes, but still um, with one exception that he worked on later, but still they're much more like bacterial genomes than than they are like organellar genomes. So if you think of plastids, you know, chloroplasts, and mitochondria, and you look at the gene sets in those, they are nothing near um, adequate to support cellular processes, right? They can't replicate themselves and do their own translation. All, they've lost all kinds of parts that are now encoded in the host genome, so the plant host or the eukaryotic host, okay? So basically mitochondrion is n nowhere near able to take care of itself. Whereas these bacterial, um, genomes um, are more bacterial-like. They have most of the parts in general that if, like if, I always like to think of, you know, someone was taking a cell biology or molecular biology class, intro class, and they just had to list all of the th things you have to have to replicate the cell to transcription, translation, you need the ribosome. Pretty much they keep almost all of those pieces. Sometimes you see exceptions, but possibly it's due to our ignorance. So like all the tRNA synthetases, they'll tend to have them. They can make their own ribosome. Um, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, they tend to keep all of those uh, things plus a set of genes that are for the host nutrition and so on. Th what they tend to lose a lot of are things involved in making the cell envelope like the cell wall, um, the peptidoglycan, phospholipids. They lose um, um, some of the genes encoding enzymes for those processes. Possibly those are things the host has taken over. But the kind of central informational processes they mostly keep. Um, so, but you can still call them organelles, it's fine with me. People want to, they always ask, oh, aren't these organelles? And uh, to me, it's whatever you want to call them is fine. But um, they do differ from what we otherwise call organelles in some ways. There's some really weird things. For example, um, in two different cases, um, 
we found this recoding um, of the genetic code. So basically the UGA codon, which normally is a stop codon in the universal code, there was only one other case in bacteria um, in free, in sort of bacteria that are not organelles um, that was known, it was the mycoplasmas. Um, and it, turns, it has turned up in two, Hodgkinia and Zenderia, an alpha and a beta proteobacterium, so independent events. In, in, in this case, the UGA um, has, is no longer a stop codon and now encodes tryptophan. Um, and that was first evident just from the sequences. Um, suddenly everything made sense if you put it as tryptophan. And then um, John actually proved it um, for the Hodgkinia with some peptides. Um, and our hypothesis for this is that basically the genome reduction that that one step along the way was they, the, the protein, the release factor two, which recognizes the UGA as a stop codon, that if it was lost from a genome, well, normally you'd think that's use, that's going to be a lethal mutation, right? I mean, an organism, suddenly you don't recognize a lot of stop codons, that's going to affect a lot of genes, mess, mess things up. But somehow, if that could happen and the organism doesn't die, and maybe it wouldn't because maybe there's another stop codon really soon down the line and the protein's a little longer but still functions, um, then then what would happen is you would you suddenly it would no longer be a stop codon because it would no longer be recognized and then you'd have compensatory adaptation to okay let's put in a real stop codon there and selection would favor um, some compensation that would free up UGA to encode tryptophan which it actually has some affinity with the tryptophan um, anticodon anyway so so um, that's kind of the view is that extreme genome reduction can give rise to these kind of events that are extremely rare in nature, but because slightly deleterious mutations can be fixed and if the thing doesn't die, they, you're seeing these unusual things happen. Well, one, um, one interesting thing is sort of the route to getting to these small genomes. So you start with a normal genome and you get to a tiny one. What happens in between and the way we try to study that um, is by looking at um, genomes that are basically young symbionts that have recently become symbionts that still have close relatives that are, that are more normal free-living bacteria that have free-living stages. There's a few examples of this. Actually, the first one that, was that a genome was sequenced for was um, a group studying Mycobacterium leprae, the leprosy bacterium. It's close to other Mycobacteriums, except that it's now much like a kind of host-restricted thing that only lives in hosts and so on. And it was the first genome that had this pattern where you see reduction, so loss of genes, but you also see you also see a lot of pseudogenes accumulating. So bacterial genomes typically don't have lots of pseudogenes in them the way some eukaryotes do. Um, Mycobacterium leprae had a lot of pseudogenes. A lot of transposable elements start to accumulate, which usually they're quite limited in normal bacterial genomes. Um, and so it was an example of that where the coding density was actually less. It had a larger genome compared to the number of intact genes. And then another one that came out was a symbiont of tsetse fly, Sodalis glossinidius. It showed that pattern too, lots of pseudogenes. And then the one that we studied in aphids was Serratia symbiotica, um, which is an aphid symbiont that is closely related to free-living Serratia, so probably it's a fairly young symbiosis. And it showed this kind of um, genomic chaos of many IS elements and inactivated genes. This is showing, here's, so, so here's Serratia symbiotica, here's Serratia. So basically it's right in there with the rest of them, um, pretty closely related to them. I don't know how long that is in time. Um, and if we sequence the genome, it's actually evident from the genome that, it's an ob that it only lives as a symbiont. It's lost a lot of pathways that, that show that it can only live in a host. So we could sort of figure out, yes, it's um, like it can't make some amino acids and so on that a normal bacteria could make. But it's massively reduced. So here's one of the sort of free living, there are about five megabases, 5,000 genes. And here's Serratia symbiotica, which is far smaller, even though it's closely related. And then sequencing the genome, and this is the same pattern that's seen in these other examples. So this, um, the Serratia symbiotica has this very reduced genome, and it's just completely mixed up and rearranged. There's many, many rearrangements. Whereas when you look at two other Serratia that are approximately the same divergence apart, they're pr pretty much lining up very well. Um, so it just looks like once this thing became symbiotic, Large deletions have probably occurred, maybe whole chunks of chromosome lost at once. Um, just to lose that amount of DNA, you, you need some larger deletions probably. And then lots of rearrangements. And it had a large number of IS elements, transposable elements, which might mediate um, those rearrangements. But this is the pattern that's been seen in several cases. Um, this is just one of them. It also has many pseudogenes. So um, the serratia here is this dark blue line. And the pseudogenes, basically a large 
portion of the detectable genes were pseudogenes. And we could see that in other serratia they're intact, but they're broken in this one. And so um, it had this accumulation of sort of, of dead genes in it. So that's kind of the pathway to get there. But then once they get small, they get relatively stable. There's usually not, in most of the groups that have been looked at, um, there are very few rearrangements. There's all these exceptions, but that the general pattern is that they don't have many rearrangements. And they seem to just keep on losing genes, getting smaller and smaller. Um, this, um, Dan Sloan's a postdoc in the lab, about to go to Colorado State University, and he's been looking at some of these tiny genomes. He's interested in organelle genomics and evolution, and looked, he, um, because of next-gen sequencing, actually some of the old samples of psyllids that, that Paul sent us, could take the old tube with all the broken DNA that's been in the freezer for, and just get some Illumina sequencing and completely sequence the carcinella genome from it for a small amount of money, which in the past you never would have dreamed was possible. But um, anyway, he resequenced, he took out a set of, so we got a set of six carcinellas that are sort of in these species pair, and he just mapped out the gene loss, and basically gene loss is ongoing, and the different lineages are losing genes, and all of them are equally small, so the, the first one sequenced was not an anomaly, they're all basically equally small, and basically genes continue to be lost, including pathways that might be useful to the host. And then they show this stability, though, if you compare the gene order, they're always very stable and without rearrangements, that's the, the most common pattern, and these are very stable. Okay, so what happens? They're getting smaller and smaller. Um, how do they compensate for this? Um, well, one thing is you could have some compensation in the same genome in the symbiont. The, the best candidate for this is that in all of these cases, they really um, highly express um, their chaperones, so chaperonin and other sort of heat shock proteins that can deal with destabilized, protein, destabilized um, peptides. And this is a pattern that's seen again and again. They're always the most highly expressed genes now that we you know, look at transcriptomes and stuff from these symbionts. So um, it was first noticed in Buchnera, um, this HSP60 or chaperonin is um, highly expressed and it turned out actually other heat shock proteins, so the DNA K and DNA J, they're highly expressed too, the whole set of them are. Constitutively, without any heat shock, they're always highly expressed. And so this could be a way, kind of a compensation, you have all these less stable protein, so you make, you just invest a lot in kind of refolding them and recycling them and sort of dealing with the protein destabilization because it's an ongoing, so that could compensate to some extent. It shows that there is some adaptation. I mean, these, these organisms, you know, there, there is selection on them. There is adaptation. It's just that some of the changes are not adaptive changes. And so other small genes, genomes, um, symbionts and pathogens also show these high expression of, of grow el and other heat shock proteins. And it's been shown that if you overexpress grow el you can mask deleterious amino acid replacements. Um, that's been shown in E. coli and in other, other organisms too, like flies. Um, so another thing is maybe the host is doing a lot of stuff, and that has to be true. Obviously, the host is providing molecules in some way. It's, it's still not shown that any proteins um, produced by the host are entering the bacterial cell and doing things as enzymes or as part of cellular processes. So that hasn't been shown. It could be happening, but it hasn't been shown despite a little bit of trying. Um, for sure, small molecules go in, right, metabolites that go in that are the nutrients for. And, um, and so the, the symbiont is basically parasitic on the host for many um, molecules. Um, also, probably the host is contributing a lot to the, the cell wall um, and just the cell envelope in general by producing components of it. And that seems likely just from looking at these genomes because often they're very deficient in um, the biosynthetic pathways for those. So probably the host is somehow providing the boundary between its, um, its cytosol and that of the cell. That's the easiest interpretation. All We just don't know. Um, but we don't know that any gene products from the host are actually imported in, although it's possible. Um, one thing that people often um, hypothesize is that bacterial genes might be transferred to the host genome, and that's why they're not in the bacterial genome, and then, then the products are imported back in. And the reason that's an obvious hypothesis is that is what happens in plastids and mitochondria. It, um, so that could be happening in but um, in, in these symbionts, but in, it looks like it's fairly limited, but there probably will be some cases. Um, this postdoc, Allison Hansen, who's about to go to University of Illinois, um, entomology department. She has been looking a lot at the gene expression of the aphid. So once the aphid genome was sequenced, you could look at, you had a, a foundation for looking at aphid gene expression and how the bacteriocyte, the specialized cells that house 
how is this a symbiont? How is it expressing genes that might support the symbiont and so on? And so she has done quite a lot of work on this. And one, the, um, one that I'll just summarize is she, she was interested in maybe the, the aphid has, has a role in the amino acid sort of production machinery and basically found this huge signature of upregulation of of aphid genes involved in amino acid metabolism and biosynthesis in the bactericides compared to the rest of the body. So the bactericides like a little factory for making amino acids, and the aphid plays its part along with the Buchnera. So the, the Buchnera pathways are in here, and basically she just mapped out how all these different parts go together. Um, one of them being this final, st this this gene for the final step in branched chain amino acid is very highly expressed in bact specifically in bactericides, which suggests that the aphid is carrying out that step. A lot of transporters highly expressed. Those are actually one of the things missing from the Buchnera genome. Um, so are there genes transferred to the host genome? When the PA, we, we expect it, and well, you might think it happens in organelles, why shouldn't it always happen? But maybe it's not that easy for it to happen. Um, so when the PA fit genome was first sequenced, 2010, it first, was the first time we could really exhaustively look through the host genome and see, are there any genes that came from bacteria, and specifically from Buchnera? And it turned out there were some. And it turn, it's turning out that a lot of animal genomes actually do have some genes that come from bacteria. Now that we have enough databases and so on, we can search. And um, it's not that rare, but it's usually a small number. And it, in the case of aphids, it was ele they had 11 intact genes um, that were, are clearly from bacteria. The phylogeny is very strong support. They're definitely in the aphid genome. Um, and, but in all cases, they come from, they don't seem to come from Buchnera. They come from other bacteria, usually something very close to Wolbachia. So probably some past aphid ancestor had Wolbachia. Some genes were transferred. And um, those genes have been maintained. And they're highly expressed actually in the bactericides. So they have a function, but it's not fully known. And I just want to mention some um, John McCutcheon who's in Montana now, but he's been continuing some work on, um, in, on mealybugs. And he's, he's got some recent results. Um, on mealybugs. I noticed this is the headquarters for mealybug appreciation because I, I was in this room today in, um, <laughs> in Briggs. I went in. Um, there are beautiful portraits of mealybugs in, in Briggs. Um, and um, anyway, in mealybugs, depending on the species, and he has looked at a couple, there's some cases where the host genome is, has actually got genes that have come from different bacterial sources, Wolbachia, Arsenophonus, different things that are sometimes symbiotic. And basically, um, pathways can actually um, be accomplished through the contribution of host genes and genes from a symbiont as well, or even two different symbionts. So basically, all these genes moving around to, together put these pathways together. Those are kind of exceptional, the, these symbionts and mealybugs that are the, the Tremblea, which Paul Bauman first studied, actually. But um, um, those are the cases where our genomes really kind of mixing it together um, in an extreme way, um, which is somewhat different from what we usually see. Um, these transfer genes are generally highly expressed. They seem to, um, um, the ones that he found, function in amino acid metabolism, but also even in bacterial cell wall biosynthesis. So the mealybug genome has genes from a bacterium that help make bacterial cell walls, so that, and they're highly expressed in the bacteriocyte. So that's kind of amazing. It's actually kind of a clear indication that probably the host is helping to make the, the envelope between it and the bacterial cell. So another thing that can happen is you acquire new symbionts. And so this is the last little case I'm going to give you um, that supplant or supplement the ancestral ones. You're dependent on this de decrepit old symbiont. You want a new one who actually can do new things, right? So, um, so, um, so one case we recently looked at is in spittle bugs. And these are xylem feeders. They're the, in this Okenorinca. And if you remember, they had these two symbionts, green in, in these pictures are Solcia. These are in situ hybridizations. So these are the bactericides containing solcia, and red is zinderia, um, this beta proteobacterium. Here's the little bactericides. This was in um, a species of spittle bug collected in Arizona. So solcia is making seven amino acids, zinderia is making three. That was worked out previously by John. And the, sol the zinderia cells, they're actually, so zinderia is really extreme. It's 13.5% um, GC, which is insane. That's the coding proteins. Um, the, it's on this extremely, here's the beta proteobacteria, here's Zinderia on a protein-based tree. It's like crazy fast evolution. The cells look really decrepit and amorphous and, um, and so on. So, you know, they, they, it seems like something that's kind of barely functioning. Um, but who knows, you know, it's present in most, um, it turns out, we, we did a survey. Previously, we'd only looked at that one single species of spittlebug. It turns out, doing a survey of different spittlebug groups, um, 
Most of them have Zinderia. So here's Sulcia, they all have Sulcia, 100%. And then Zinderia, most of the groups have Zinderia. A couple missing ones here that we're not sure what's going on. And then, um, but there's one clade right here, which is the Philanine, which is actually by far the most abundant group of, of um, spittle bugs. Like all of you have had them hopping on you and up in your nose and things. They're everywhere, they're hopping around at the end of sort of the summer. Um, the meadow spittle bug being a very widespread species. It's probably got the broadest host range, I think recorded host range of any herbivorous insect or something like that. So, so this group, um, this highly successful spittle bug group actually has lost Cinderia completely and instead it has this Sodalis-like symbiont is what we call it. And so um, together with um, Ryoichi Koga, um, a Japanese researcher who was in the lab for a while, sequenced the genomes and he, he got really into these circos <laughs> slides. So I, he made a whole bunch of these, <laughs> which are, don't really, but anyway, he compared the genome <laughs> using these kinds of graphics. <laughs> um, and um, I thought I had to show one of them. And um, the, so, so the Sodalis like symbiont of this spittle bug, he compared it to other Sodalis. It's actually far smaller. It's only 1.4 megabases as opposed to 4.1. It's reduced massively. And um, he then worked out um, the metabolism of it, which I'll just mention really quickly. He basically, so again, made this, meta, this the metabolic map and he, um, hypothesize which bacterium was capable of which steps in making essential amino acids. So it turns out that um, basically um, the sodalis, these three, these three amino acids, methionine, histidine, and tryptophan that were made by Zinderia in, in most spittle bugs and in an ancestor of these spittle bugs presumably, are now taken over by sodalis. So it's kept those pathways, it's replacing them. But then a few pathways, there's redundancy where both symbionts can make it at this point. And then some of them though, are only made by sulcia. So this basically means that um, you've got to keep sulcia because it's the only source of these. And now you've got to keep this one because it's the only source of these. So it kind of sets in stone that you've got to keep these two partners there because both of them are essential for something, even though they're redundant in some places. And then he also has, um, did a lot of work looking into um, just the, the energy metabolism, which seems to be the main thing that's massively changed. And so um, um, has this idea that basically by the combination, you know, they, they basically have regained a TCA cycle in the Sodalis-like symbiont and that maybe this is, gives some advantage in energy metabolism, which is actually the, the primary problem feeding on xylem is that there's no sugar in it. Most of the energy is actually in the amino acids themselves. And so they have to be used as an energy source, which um, possibly, depending on your symbiont, um, you could have an advantage in doing that. So one idea is here you gained a new symbiont that's actually making this a better xylem feeder and you know, giving some advantages. But one, um, the, the Japanese in particular, Ryuichi Koga, he is most famous because he's the best um, person at doing in situ hybridization on insect tissues and insect symbionts in probably the world. And he came and did a, lot, a whole bunch of these. But um, one thing he, he figured out is that in gaining this new symbiont, it basically invaded a, a new bacteria site was, was basically evolved that was housing this new symbiont. So it didn't just invade an old bacteria site and interact to replace it. A whole new bacteria site type evolved, a new cell type in the host. And so probably it was a gradual process where initially it was a facultative symbiont that then was interact, the host co-evolved with it to produce a new bacteria site type. And then the old Zinderia type was lost. So it's, it's sort of evolutionary obstacles. It's not easy for a new, a new bacterium to just replace an old one as a symbiont because the host and symbiont have co-evolved. Clearly, it's very difficult just to put in a totally new organism. Okay, so just to return to the plots, I tried to make this case that having these small genomes um, results, well, clearly we can just see as a fact that again and again it results in these extreme changes in, in genomes um, when the symbiont goes in for this lifestyle. And it's a little bit more conjectural that this is an evolutionary problem for the host, but it seems like at some point there's got to be a limit to how many, they are dependent on these symbionts. And, um, we, um, and I think one indication that it's a problem is the fact that you do see these, these things happening that seem to be solutions. So um, the host may compensate, but you also see the symbiont replacement. I, I gave you one example. There's actually a number of examples now of a symbiont that seems to replace an ancestral symbiont, but you get kind of a, a new normal genome that's still more intact. So you get this kind of complexity evolving because sometimes you end up with accumulating several symbionts at once as a result of this process. So one thing I haven't mentioned is gut symbionts, which is what the whole world's constantly talking about now. And those can be important too in some organisms. They're harder to study. 
but they won't have these same, I just want to point out, they don't go down the same evolutionary path, right? They're recombining, they're going in and out, there are many different um, clones can be in the same individual host where they exchange genes. But the problem there is they may not be on your side, right? That at least the maternally transmitted one, selection in general, the fitness of the symbiont and that of the host are very linked. And so the symbiont will generally not evolve to harm its host. Where that's a lot less obvious, I would say, with gut symbionts. People I think should think about that a little. They're beneficial. Yeah, you need gut symbionts. It's normal to have them, and development won't be normal without them. But they may not all be good. I mean, it's, it's kind of this very complex thing. They could have features that are, um, that are against the sort of health interests of the host. We actually are working a lot on these now um, in the honeybee gut. I just wanted to mention again, I'm trying to actually establish the microbiology of these different bacteria and giving them names and they, finding out where they live in the gut and ultimately what they do in the gut. But I'm not talking about that today. So, so with that, I just want to acknowledge the people who did. I talked a lot about John's work on all these tiny genomes, he really made a big difference by just going in and, and actually putting them together and interpreting them. Ryo Koga um, did um, the work on the spittle bug system I talked about at the end. Allison um, is now going to Illinois, work, is working on the, um, the sort of host end of um, gene expression and how the hosts evolve with the host, with the bacteria. Oh, I took his slides out, but he worked on cockroach symbionts that key. Um, Asushi was involved in sequencing the first Carcinella genome sequence, the first of the tiny genomes, which had to be repeated a couple times because it was kind of unbelievable at the time. Dan Sloan worked on the psyllid symbionts, and Gordon's working on leafhopper symbionts. I also want to just acknowledge other people in the lab, my husband, Howard, and also Paul and Linda Bellman, who are here with us today, which is nice. Um, Paul's the one who got me started on symbionts, so I'm very grateful to him for that. Thank you. We're, we're at 5 o'clock, but if anybody has some questions for Nancy. Um, I, was, I was wondering why you think that, 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 that genes have been transferred from some of these transient symbionts, but not from the obligate symbionts. And I was wondering if you think we might be missing some of the genes that have been transferred from the obligate, obligate symbionts because they've been lost from the symbiont genome. Yeah, you know, I actually don't know why. I wouldn't necessarily have predicted it, but now that we know it, we can explain it in various ways. <laughs> um, it's one of those things. Um, well, Wolbachia in particular really interacts with germline cells a lot and inter, you know, goes into them a lot um, throughout the life cycle, so, or for a longer part of it. And so that's, to be incorporated into the host genome, you have to get into germline, right? Whereas Bucnera is only very briefly in the germline. Um, of the aphid, and so there's more membrane sort of barriers. Um, I don't think that's an absolute reason, but it could be one, one reason. They're actually, in the aphid genome project, there were some little bits of DNA from Bucnera that were confirmed to be in the aphid genome, but they were just bits of genes, but they were very close to the current Bucnera, right? Because, well, they're basically um, functionless DNA, so they're gonna degenerate really quickly, so you would only see the very recently, the recent arrivals. And there were some cases, so it's not impossible. I think DNA can go, you know, the, anything we've learned, is it can go anywhere and incorporate anywhere. Um, but so it's not impossible, but for some reason it hasn't happened. Um, maybe it just wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't, I mean, one thing that has to happen is it has to be positively selected rather quickly, right? That, that gene and its function needs to be um, beneficial to fitness um, before it degenerates, right? So um, it's not that obvious which, if you don't have an importation machinery to get it back into the bacterial, it's not obvious that there's immediate selection for it. In the long run, it might be better if those genes were in a sexual genome and they weren't declining, but in the short run, there's not an immediate advantage maybe to moving them there. So, you know, but so far, yeah, I, um, I, I mean, I think probably there will be some cases that, that are found, but it's, so far, it's mostly been from Wolbachia, also Arsenophonus, and Cardinium, which is a, another kind of facultative symbiont, um, has transferred genes to host genomes. Yeah. What makes bacteriocytes so tightly coupled to housing a particular species or strain of bacterium? What is it about them? How do they evolve? How do they diversify? Right. Um, yeah, so like the developmental or in, in aphids, the development's been studied some, and they're, they're actually defined very early. They're a distinctive cell type very early. Um, in fact, they're kind of a syncytium 
that um, the Bukmira invade and then it become kind of divided, you know, that it becomes cellularized. Um, and so it's, in terms of how they evolved originally, it's not really clear. Um, you know, there's several, you can, I mean, there's kind of two possible sort of obvious routes for these endosymbionts to have arisen. Um, one is maybe from gut symbionts that somehow became maternally transmitted. That would be one route that gut symbionts might play some of these roles in nutrition and somehow they become maternally transmitted and you get this whole kind of change. So that in that case, the bactericides would likely evolve from some kind of gut cells. But the other could be that they evolved from sort of facultative symbionts that were more invasive, you know, more pathogen-like things that are invading an insect body cavity and getting into cells, and but then sometimes that's benefit, you sort of evolve a cell type that houses them. Um, and it's actually not obvious to me which of those is mo more common. The bactericide types, the, the cell types seem, you know, they're very different in different insects and different locations and things, so maybe they've evolved in different ways. Um, yeah. How many thoughts on why the evolution is all in the, the direction of losing the ability to, to make the, the various enzymes as opposed to gaining, getting the, the ability back again. Yeah, so basically in these things, gene loss, you know, they can lose things. It's, you know, it's easy to lose a gene. You just inactivate it or delete part of it. And they just don't seem to incorporate any foreign DNA. So I maybe didn't emphasize that, but unlike many bacteria, these small genome bacteria don't take up genes from anything else. So there's no gene acquisition. Um, DNA acquisition in the symbiont genomes. And, you know, we can see that just because they never have anomalous DNA you know, genes that seem to, you know, it's basically, so unlike many, back, most bacterial lineages, they're not taking up DNA. That's, that's why it's this kind of one-way street. Um, basically, they only lose stuff, so. Um, well, I don't know, actually, and that is, um, you know, they lose a lot of repair pathways and recombination. Um, enzymes, so possibly they don't have the mechanics for it, but I, I'm not totally convinced that's the reason. Maybe the gene, genome architecture actually becomes really constrained just because it's so tight and putting things in messes it is, I, you know, it's not really clear. It's just a pattern that we see. <laughs> Joanna. I'm not sure if I have the burden like this, but I guess I'm trying to get at the levels of selection on these things. I guess is there any selection within an individual host, or is it the level of host fitness? Yeah. And so, like, what's known about just the, the fitness impacts of some of these mutations and, say, your, your lab mutation accumulation experience? Yeah. Yeah, well, they weren't on purpose, those mutation accumulations. Right, <laughs> they just, right. after yeah, 10 like years, they had. Years. But, um, you know, they're definitely, they're, like, we had one, we keep them at constant 20 degrees. We had one mutation that, um, that, um, basically knocked out the, the heat shock response for one heat shock gene, a small heat shock protein. And basically those things were, you know, they couldn't, like even, even going to 25, they were dead. I mean, I mean, basically they had no heat tolerance. So, you know, that was a, and that, it happened to be, like they're AT bias spook mirror. So a very common um, mutation is if you have a run of A's or T's to get a, a frame shift one way or the other, that's a very common way of inactivating a gene. It's the most common in, in these genomes. and so. That it happened that um, the pr promoter for the heat shock thing had a, a run of A's in, in the spacer and it would go down and then it would be, it happened, it actually repeatedly happened in our growth chambers and it happens outdoors in the field too. So if there's a cool spring, I'm sure many P. aphids, you know, are basically getting, because it actually was also selected, there was some advantage to not having the response if you were at a cool temperature, right? So, so um, but in that case, it, both the aphid, you know, the, the, there's not a conflict in, in levels of selection for that particular case, right? It's just changing for both of them depending on the environment. And since these are strictly vertically transmitted, the main time there'd be a conflict is if is in a sexual generation, um, in which case um, the the bacteria should not want to invest in males, and they should only want females. And, and um, whereas the host would have equal and interest. And so for some of the things like Wolbachia, people have looked at that a lot. And these. Um, we, you know, it seems like basically the Bukmira are just entrapped by the host. They're, they're, you know, there's not much they can do about males um, one way or the other probably, but um, production. So we haven't really seen that. But um, so pr for the aphid system in particular, other insects, I mean, potentially there are things that are involved in like sexual insects where there's conflicts that happen. That, that, that is possible, yeah, particularly in males. I mean, Bukmira shouldn't care if its male host lives or dies, right? Um, so 
because it's dead end for him any for them anyway. So um, so you might see something about how book marrow behaves in males or something. It's the same with mitochondria or something. But but um, yeah. But for other cases, there, there could the facultative symbionts that are moving around. There's much more possibility for a conflict because they can you know exploit this host that, to increase their chances of moving to another host. Yeah. Uh, some of the genes you mentioned which were deleted from the uh, symbionts were the cell envelope and membrane taurine. So I was wondering if that could be because since they don't have amino acid transporters, so the membrane could be fluid enough for the movement of amino acid to synthesize it. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I mean, they don't have the transporters, so that is one thing that's strange that's missing. It's actually not known how things move in and out, so I don't know how to speculate about it. Um, but yeah, maybe, yeah, that could be that there's actually been selection against having such a barrier because you need it. Um, the, the host, probably the host-derived um, membrane, that in most of these, there is a host-derived um, So there's a very high uh, expression of these transporter um, encoding genes in the bacteriocytes. And they probably are in those membranes around, they could be in the outer membrane, but uh, in them. And so maybe the host is actually the more active um, gatekeeper in terms of movement somehow. But, but yeah, there, but that was one of the, the genes, the gene categories that was very high in bacteriocytes, amino acid transporter. We have time for one more question. Right. Do the, uh, the long branches and the conversion losses of genes and this altered increased frequencies pose any challenges for the placement of these obligate symbionts within a larger bacterial tree? Um, well, sometimes, um, you know, the trees, when you have a lot, so one thing that can happen is, I mean, I, I think the broad placement, um, this is an alpha in a, a group of alpha, a general group of alpha proteins is pretty secure. But, um, but um, if you're looking at, say, a, a group that has several origins of endosymbionts, and actually Buchnera is a, an example. So there's this one group of gamma proteobacteria where there's a number of endosymbionts in insects that are related. And if most ways you make trees, they'll actually come out as a clade. But, I, but they're on long branches, and I, it, I just regard it as unresolved. They could have come from a related group of bacteria, and you know, due to artifacts um, and phylogenetic reconstruction, they go together. Um, and you were just getting, actually, Dan Sloan, there was a really beautiful case that, so um, Bemisia uh, is the, um, oh, the Portiera, the symbiont of whiteflies and the symbiont of, of psyllids. They're two groups of bacteria. They're kind of in the same general group of gamma proteobacteria, really long branches, really crazy long branches, especially for carcinella. Um, and so, it was, but they seem to maybe be sister groups, which would be interesting because psyllids and whiteflies are related. It would put the origin back a little farther. And so he, he actually did um, a, like a, just a gene order phylogeny. He comes from the plant chloroplast world. Of, they do a lot of that for plant. So basically, you know, looking at gene arrangements Basically, you're looking for shared derived gene arrangements, um, and he got very strong support that they do go together among all sequenced genomes. So that is kind of a new source of information that's somewhat independent of the sequence information. That, and so maybe doing more of that um, if people wanted to straighten out what's related to what would work. <laughs>